imagine you are a young child of about five years old. You live in a country that has been plagued by violence and political unrest for as long as you can remember. But because you're five years old, most of this escapes you and you've actually been kept pretty safe from what's been going on in the country. Occasionally you might hear rumblings, whispered discussions or even arguments, specifically between your dad and your grandfather. Your dad and your grandfather are pretty important people in the land and so whenever something happens, they're usually the ones who know about it and talk about what needs to happen. But again, you don't really worry too much about this because you know your dad and you've also heard stories about how your dad has protected people before. He's protected the people of the country that you live in. And maybe it's a little bit of, you know, dad worship or dad, you know, fondness, but you think that anybody who would have the courage to mess with your dad is gonna be in big trouble. And life continues on as normal for you until there one day, one day when your dad and, and your grandpa both get news. This news is pretty severe because it basically causes them to stop what they're doing and go out and fight against the people who live next door to you. It causes them to go out to the neighboring countries and fight the bad guys. See, whenever you play soldier with you and your friends, the bad guys are always the people next door. And now the game has become real life. Your dad and your grandpa go out to fight the bad guys. Now in the past, dad and grandpa have gone out to fight bad guys before, but this time it's different. This time is different because dad and grandpa, they don't come home you hear the terrible news that your five-year-old brain struggles to understand. Dad and grandpa are dead. Now you actually don't know your grandfather very that well, very well. In fact, maybe that's actually kind of a good thing because of the things that you have heard about him that other people have said is that your grandpa is kind of an impulsive man. He's consumed by jealousy and he's actually not a very good dad to your dad. Your dad has been very kind to you, but his dad, your grandpa was not the same way. Your dad, he's the kind of dad who comes home after a long busy day at work of protecting people. And he's the kind of dad who would just scoop down and pick you up and, and put you on his shoulders and run around and play because he always seems to have just enough energy for you, even though it's been a long day. But now dad is gone. And to make matters even more confusing, the invading army that they went off to go fight, well, well, they, they lost. So they, they slink away in defeat, even though your dad is dead. Before you can really even start to wrap your mind around that, you start to hear news, news that causes your family a lot more fear. And so your family actually has to run away in fear. Your family has to flee in fear because of what they hear. And you leave with your family and you're only five years old and you're struggling to keep up with them but you can't because you're so small. Your legs aren't even long enough to, to, to run as fast as they can. There's no time to grab a set of wheels. So in desperation, your, your family caretaker or, or your nurse, she, she runs and, and she picks you up as you're struggling to keep up. She picks you up and she tries to carry you as your family runs. And as this is happening, you don't know how much longer that this can keep on going. How much longer this nurse can carry you, a five-year-old. You're not a baby anymore. You know, maybe it's the, the heat of the day. Maybe it's the terror and the fear. Maybe it's the hunger or the darkness as the day after day of running starts to 
add up and you're now also running at night, but something happens. The nurse that's been carrying you, she trips and she falls and you hear that sound, the sound that nobody ever wants to hear when they fall down. And in fact, you hear it before you feel it. You hear snap, something is broken. And you don't know exactly what it is, but all of a sudden your legs and your feet are completely useless. And so your family escapes and runs into the wilderness, runs into the countryside, hiding in fear, and you are partially paralyzed for the rest of your life. And sometime later, a couple years later, after you've already lost your dad, lost your grandpa, you've lost your house, you hear a story about your uncle, a, a man who you don't know very well. Um, and actually the people in the town don't really like him all that much either. And he's murdered too. And this time you overhear that the people who murdered your uncle, your, your family member, the people who are responsible for his death they, they killed him because they were trying to impress somebody. They did it because they were trying to impress somebody who was important. They were trying to impress somebody who is now the ruler of the land. Before we start to find out who that person is, it's important for us to pause because you're not just some random child in a story. Your grandpa was the king. Your father was the prince. And your uncle was the next in line to inherit the throne. You see, the people who killed your uncle did so because they wanted to be on the good side of the person who, that, who everybody was saying that they're going to be the new king. And so if, if somebody was around from the previous ruling family, well, they had to kill them off just to make sure that this new guy didn't have anybody who was trying to compete for their power. So you hear about this, this new king, but it doesn't really make sense because you've actually heard the stories about this guy before. And, and this guy is actually, he was like best friends with your dad. It said that, that your, your dad and this, new, and this new ruler, they were closer than brothers. Well, after hearing about how he murdered your, your uncle or, or ordered somebody to murder your uncle, apparently his feelings towards your family has changed. And so now you start to put things together and you ask, well, what's to stop him from wiping out every member of the royal family? You know that when you're a kid, and adults are talking to each other. And in order for you not to understand what's going on, they, they spell something out because they think that you don't know what it is that they're saying. Or they tell you to, to leave the room because, well, the adults are talking and, and kids shouldn't hear this. Or what's most patronizing of all is, they'll tell you when you're older and you can understand. Well, you're older now, years have gone by, and you've gotten used to a lot of things. You've gotten used to the fact that you can't move around anymore, really. You know, being unable to use your feet has a lot of setbacks. One of the setbacks is that people start to identify you based off of your disability, based off of your, your inability to use your feet your sort of inability to use your feet is almost your, your last name. When people are talking about you, they'd say, oh, you mean the person who is lame in both feet? Or, oh, you mean the person who can't use his feet? Oh yeah, yeah, I know him. You've gotten used to hearing that. You've gotten used to not living in the land that you grew up in. The memories of your hometown, well, they're just memories now. 
you've gotten used to hearing bits and pieces of your former family. You've gotten used to hearing bits and pieces about what was going on between your grandfather and your father. You've learned about how your grandpa, when he was the king, he practically ran the country into the ground, trying to pursue this person who now everybody says is the new king. And what's so crazy is that you even hear stories about how your grandfather wanted to kill your dad because you heard about how, or because he heard how your dad and this other guy were best friends. And even as time has gone on, you actually start to hear good things about this other guy as well, but you're struggling to understand this. You don't understand why. This doesn't make a lot of sense because if, if that's true, then then why did he kill your uncle, your, his, his best friend's brother? I mean, you never really had that strong of feelings for your uncle, but still, it just doesn't really make sense to you. And one day as you're sitting, because that's all you can really do is sit around, one day while you're sitting and minding your own business, you look up. And in the distance, you notice a figure that you sort of realize, you sort of recognize, you know, it's been years, but is that, is that the man who was your grandpa's servant in the palace? Is that your grandfather who was the king? Was that his right-hand man? Was that his servant? When you were a kid, you always just called him Z because you couldn't pronounce his name. But as you look, it is him, it's, it's Z. Z is back in your life. He's basically standing in front of you right now. He, he found you. What does he want? What is he doing here? Well, he goes on to explain that he's back in the government business. He's now the servant of the new king. And the new king wants to see you. And as you're sitting there, it takes about three seconds for the confusion to clear away, to be replaced with dread. The king wants to see you. Oh no, you think to yourself, the king, the man who reportedly had my uncle killed to secure power, he must have found out about me too. And now he wants to have me killed, the son of the prince, somebody else who might be a challenge to his power. He must want to have me killed. So you start to think to yourself, well, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna run away? That's not really an option. It seemed that, that option of running away faded a long time ago since you can barely walk as it is. Besides, even if somehow you were able to get away it wouldn't take too long before the king's men and, and all the king's resources were able to, to find you and probably just dispatch you there and then. And so you agree to go along with the servant, maybe to beg for mercy. You know, look at you, you're, you're a nobody, you're no threat to the king. Maybe you go to beg for mercy and and to get on the king's good side. Or maybe you just go because you know the inevitable and you might as well just get it all over with. After the journey back, when you arrive back home, back in the land that you grew up in, you start to notice something. Actually, you kind of notice a lot of things. One of the things is that everybody seems to be a lot happier now. It seems like the city just, has an energy to it. The buildings seem to be repaired. Everybody seems to be a little bit, you know, more energized than what you remember them being when grandpa was in charge. But regardless of how the people seem to appear, the moment of truth has arrived because you're now at the palace where the king is. And as you're being escorted in, you notice, well, the palace looks a lot nicer than what I remember it looking like. 
And as you're ushered in to the king's presence, you start to notice something. You start to notice I'm being ushered in kind of gently. There's no real sense of urgency or animosity. Nobody's making fun of me and my inability to walk right. The guards aren't mocking me when they see my condition. And you start to think to yourself, this seems kind of strange. Why is it that nobody's making fun of me? These, these guards aren't laughing at me. And then you see him. You see the king sitting on the very throne that your grandpa used to sit at. The king, the man who decides your fate. What's funny is that this king doesn't look like what maybe you were afraid he would look like. He doesn't have an eye patch. He doesn't have scars all over his face. He isn't menacingly stroking a cat like some sort of evil villain as you're hobbling forward. In fact, the only thing that you really notice about this king besides how normal he looks is, well, like everybody says, he's kind of handsome. Well, let's get this over with. You're probably thinking to yourself as you fall to the ground in an act of begging for mercy. You fall to the ground knowing that it's pretty likely that a sword is gonna fall on you too. And as you're there in the palace in front of the king, that's when you hear it. Well, actually that's when you, I should say, you don't hear it because you don't hear the sound of a sword being drawn from its scabbard. You don't hear the clinking sound of a ceremonial ax being taken off the rack, ready to remove your head. In fact, you don't hear any of that. The, the only thing that you do hear is the soft sound of sandals hitting the stone floor as they quickly, uh, with determination, come over to you. And then you hear it. You hear your name being said. Except your name isn't being said with a tone of sarcasm or accusation or, or a sense of, of being made fun of. Rather, you hear your name said gently like the sound of somebody who is honored that they finally get to meet you. You hear your name, Mephibosheth. Yes, you respond. I am David. Do not be afraid. The king continues. He says, I know whose son you are. The stories are true. I was your father's best friend. Your father helped me escape when your grandfather was plotting an assassination attempt on me, when, when your grandpa was so consumed about rubbing me out of the picture, your father helped me escape. And the very last thing the king says that, that we ever said to each other is that we made a promise. And the promise that I made is that when I become king, I promise that I will make sure to look out for his family. I promised your dad that his family would be safe. The king goes on to say that, I know that the God of Israel has established me as, as the king. He is the one who put me in this position. And he promised me that when I was kind of inaugurated as king, that my descendant would always be on the throne. My, my children would always be on the throne. You see, the God of Israel has been faithful in his love for me. And when you think about it, even though I'm the king, I'm a nobody. I was the youngest of my brothers. I'm a nobody from sheep country. And here I am because of God's faithful love. And as the king is saying this, you start to stammer out a, a response, uh, half unbelieving what you're hearing, half not really sure you're actually awake, like you're dreaming, but you start to almost interrupt the king and say, why would you, why would you pay attention to a dead dog like me? And as, as you're stumbling over your own words, the king almost kind of seems to ignore your question because David continues and he says, I want to show God's loving kindness 
for the sake of your father. I want to show you God's love because of whose son you are. The king goes on to say that everything that your father and the king had is now rightfully yours again. Mephibosheth, your royal inheritance is being restored to you. The king goes on to say his, his servant, the servant who was your grandfather's servant, Ziba, his name, the one who you always known as Z, with his 15 sons, well, they're now your servants. They're going to take care of everything for you. His 15 sons are going to make sure that all of your land is always cared for. All of your crops are always harvested. Mephibosheth, you're going to want for nothing. And as he says this, you can barely believe it. So you look over to Ziba, and he seems a little surprised too. And it almost seems like he seems a little annoyed or a little bit put out that he's thrust back into this role of being servant of somebody else. But nonetheless, he, he nods his head and he goes along with it. And David continues. He says, shortly after I became the king, the prophet Nathan said to me that the Lord wants to make sure that this land that we're living in, the land that he gave our people, is a land of peace and rest. So the king says to you, Mephibosheth, I want you to come home now. I want you to come home and find rest. You will always have a seat at my table with me. I know that you are Jonathan's son, which means that you're now my son. Jonathan showed me God's faithful love when I needed it the most. And now I want to show you that faithful love. I want to keep my promise that I made to your father. And so you will always sit at my family's table and you will eat in my presence just like a son eats dinner with his father. And as he's saying this, you keep waiting, wondering when the joke gets revealed. There's no indication that this is a cruel joke, some act of malicious humor before he kills you. There's no indication that the king is putting you onto anything. This is real. The king is bringing you back home. And so after he says all these things to you, and as you're being helped out by the palace attendants, and you're being shown around to your new home as they're guiding you around. You talk to some of the palace guards who were with you and you say, I don't understand. Didn't this man have my uncle killed? No, they said. You know, the people who did that, they did that because that's what they thought the king wanted because, you know, that's what normally happens. So they thought they're going to get on the king's good side. But in reality, King David, when he heard about the death of your father, Jonathan, and your grandfather, Saul, he was the one who mourned them the most. He was the one who was leading in weeping, even though the king was trying to kill him. David still mourned his death. After hearing this, you are just absolutely confounded. Oh, you say, so, so what happened to the people who thought they were doing David a favor by having my uncle killed? What happened to them? Palace guards kind of look at each other and they say, well, those people are gone. They reply. They let you know kind of in the way that they respond to that, that this is going to be the end of that conversation. And so they lead you to your new house in the palace. And as you live out the rest of your days in the palace, in the king's house, eating at the king's table, you can't help but think about all the promises that God had made to David about his sons, 
David's son that would be on the throne forever. And so there are times when you think to yourself, what are David's sons going to be like as the king? Will David's sons show the same love that David showed me? Will David's sons take after their father in the way that they treat people who are seen as the enemy? Will David's sons, when they find out that somebody is in need, when somebody has been run out of the community, when somebody who the rest of the culture looks at them and say, this person is useless to us, they have no value. Or when the culture looks at them and say, we've canceled them because we view that they are not like us. Somebody who, when the world looks at them, they say, well, this person is the enemy. Will David's son as the king Will he offer them seats at the king's table as well? Not only that, but when they're invited to the table, will the king offer a kingly inheritance to the person who was once on the outside, but has been brought in? Will David's son, the king, give a royal inheritance to somebody even though they've done really nothing to deserve it. And as you think about these things and the years go by and you've actually experienced more of the reign of David that even, you know, there, he was a good king and he was a man after God's own heart. You, you saw that David wasn't a perfect king by any stretch of the imagination. You, you've seen some examples about how you know, the decisions that he made actually turned some of his own children against him. And during that time, you know, Ziba actually tried to steal your inheritance back by slandering you in front of the king. But you were able to be reconciled with the king, and so you experienced David's goodness. And as you think about all the promises that God made to David about his son, and you ask yourselves, will he be like David? welcoming strangers in, welcoming enemies into the king's family, seating them around the table as his children. As you think about that, you're walking down the palace hallway later on in life, you think about those questions and you say, I sure hope so. And you slowly make your way back to your own house and you open up your door and there's your son who's been waiting for you to come home. And you lean down and you pick him up just like your father did with you. And you say, well, I'm back. So that story for those of you who may not be familiar with it is sort of a, a narrative story from the perspective of a man by the name of Mephibosheth, somebody who was the son of Jonathan, who was the son of King Saul. It may be a familiar story to, to many people, uh, and it may be a new story to some, but it is a beautiful picture of how God uses people to demonstrate faithful love by bringing people who were once estranged back into the family. And it's not just a story that we tell one another to sort of serve as an example about how we should welcome in other people, though it certainly is about that. But ultimately, this story is about David's greater son, David's descendant, who would sit on David's throne through all eternity, great David's greater son, Jesus. You see, Jesus is the one who welcomes us, people who are like Mephibosheth, 
people who are in desperate need of God's mercy because we can't on our own save ourselves. And so God sent Jesus into this world to rescue us, to die for us on the cross, forgiving our sins. Next week, when we take communion together, we'll celebrate this idea, this concept, this theme of being at the king's table because of what Jesus has done. But we are reminded again that as much as David failed as king later on in his life and as much as his descendants failed as king, King Jesus never fails. He always obeys God perfectly. He is the one who fulfilled for us what it means to be God's son. He is the one who fulfilled what it means for us to obey God. And Jesus is the one who took on himself the punishment for our sins so that we could be accepted into God's family as his children and to be seated at his table for all time. Through what Jesus has done, let us give thanks. Allow me to pray. Lord, we thank you for the story in 2 Samuel chapter 9 about David and Mephibosheth and how it points us to Jesus. God, we pray that our hearts would be encouraged today to see ourselves as the people who are in desperate need of rescue, that as the song that was sung at the beginning of the service, that we would say, oh, come all you unfaithful, that we would see ourselves as those people who are unfaithful, bitter, broken, scared, lost, hurting, that we would see the invitation of Jesus to come and to sit at your table as an invitation of welcome and peace. Help us to find rest in your acceptance and to also demonstrate that love and acceptance to other people as we seek to be your witnesses in this world. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.